Hi, Morgan here for Infinity, and I'm a failure. Big dumb failure. And with a healthy sense of adventure, you could be one too. Let me explain why I say that. Recently our friends at the Maker Collab ran their annual build competition. Because Onefinity is a sponsor of the Maker Collab University, we chose not to officially enter because it would be perceived as a conflict of interest. But to bring more awareness to it, we decided to work on a project alongside everyone else, keeping with the theme of the competition. Solidarity, you know. And the theme this year was music, which presented the perfect opportunity to build a project that I designed years ago. The Morg Hoffensizer. You see, I'm not a very good one, but I am a bit of a musician myself. Or, or at least I used to be. I've always had fun playing around with synthesizers, but I found them to be overly complicated and unapproachable. Too many knobs, too many controls. So I designed a synthesizer that would be very easy to play, regardless of skill level, and would make even the worst musicians sound great. This project would require the use of many different materials, and the knowledge to be able to work with and successfully incorporate all of them. It was an ambitious project, and boy, did I screw it up. So I guess that's what this video is really about. Going from ideation to design based on your machine's capabilities, incorporating various materials, metal, epoxy, electronics, wiring, and how to plan for all that. Basically general best practices, and most importantly, getting out of your comfort zone. You have a CNC and it can do so much. So hopefully you'll learn from the mistakes that I made in this project, have the confidence to try something new, and really stretch the capabilities of your machine and yourself. So let's get into it. Like I said earlier, I call it the Morg Hoffensizer an homage to the iconic synthesizer brand Korg. The instrument was primarily designed for ease of use above all else. It has only 12 keys for the 12 notes of the chromatic scale and 12 additional touch pads to be used as a sampler. All of the touch pads are copper because they connect to programmable microcontrollers that use the Arduino platform, which brings me to my first point, research. So you have an idea, something you want to make and haven't done anything like it before. Before you start working on the design, do your research. Learn everything you can about what the project entails and determine whether or not your machine and the tools at your disposal are capable. And one of those tools being your brain. In this case, I knew that my CNC would be able to handle the machining and I'd have no trouble wiring and installing all the electrical components. But once I got it all put together, can I figure out how to code it to make it actually work? I don't know anything about code or electronics. I'm actually not qualified to do any of this at all, but am I gonna let that stop me from trying? Heck no. One of my favorite quotes in the world is bite off more than you can chew than chew like hell. So I bought the microcontrollers and got to work on my design. This one's from a company called Bear Conductive and it's designed to work with conductive paint. They have an online community where their users share their projects, kind of like what we have with the Onefinity user forum. I saw a few people that made MIDI controllers on paper with conductive paint, and that was the basis for this project. I just needed to copy the code from one of those projects and do a quick mock-up on a scrap piece of plywood to make sure it works. And that's super important, prototyping. If you're gonna go out on a limb and try something brand new, test it on a scrap piece first. With my prototype done and the microcontroller functional, I started working on the final design. For this, I had to consider a few things that I didn't take into account in prototyping. First is wiring. On my prototype, I roughly laid everything out with conductive paint. I found it kind of difficult to make those consistent, so instead of painting lines, I'm gonna run actual wires from the pads to the microcontrollers. I routed them out so that the wires could sit just below the bottom surface. Just had to measure the wire with a caliper and make sure it would fit. The generic speaker wire I used was just under an eighth of an inch, so for the wiring channels, I just toolpathed them as a profile toolpath, cutting on the line, with an eighth inch spiral bit, an eighth of an inch deep. Next was cutting copper. I decided to use copper for all the touch pads because it's a soft metal which can easily be cut on my CNC and it's nice and conductive. That's why they use it for wires and stuff. So I ordered some copper sheets that are 0.03 inches thick. That's just shy of 1 16th of an inch. They'll need to sit flush with the top so no need to use anything thicker than that. And then there was lighting. After I put together the prototype, I thought of something else I could add touch capacitive lights. So that whenever you touch a key, it lights up. Seemed like a great idea. So I bought some on Amazon and started adjusting my design to incorporate them. I added recessed cavities for the sensors beneath the copper touch pads. They would need to be the perfect depth so that the light sensor would touch the copper, but allow the copper to be fully seated in its own cavity, or so I thought. That ended up being problematic later. I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. 
With a working prototype and a finalized design, I got to work on fabrication. I milled up some 8 quarter cherry, flattened it, and glued it up. I started with 8 quarters so that I'd have plenty of material to flatten the whole thing on the CNC without losing too much thickness. And when you have inlays that need to sit at a very specific depth, flattening to the z-axis is super important. So I secured my piece to the wasteboard and ran a simple flattening toolpath. I made sure to use stops so that whenever I had to take it off the machine, I'd be able to put it back on in the exact same position. This is especially important when you're doing a two-sided carve. With the top flattened of the machine, I started cutting out all the cavities for my copper parts, lighting, iPad, and logo. I created pocket tool paths for the copper touch pads and the light sensors. Again, it's real important to measure the thickness of all components with a caliper to have everything seated at the right depth. After all the tool paths for the top were done, I flipped the material over, start working on the bottom. I wanted the whole piece to have a tapered thickness, thinner at the front and thicker toward the back. To do that, I put a piece of scrap material under the front edge to lift it up, secured it in place, then ran a flattening tool path. Then I cut out everything on the back. Wiring channels, cavities for microcontrollers, everything I needed to connect the electronics. To get the wiring hooked up for the lights, I just toolpathed a one inch diameter pocket to go all the way through the material, then just fed the wires through and connected everything. Because I needed open space in those cavities between the top and the bottom to run wires, I needed to seal up the gaps to prevent epoxy from seeping through and damaging the electronics. And hot glue is perfect for that. It's crazy easy to use, dries fast, and it's non-conductive. So I just squirted a bunch of hot glue into the bottom of the light cavities to cover up the LED strips, shielding them from interacting with the epoxy, and closing up any remaining openings for the wiring. Also, it cut the amount of epoxy I needed to pour in half. At the ends of each wiring channel, I drilled a small hole to feed the wire through from the bottom to the top. And then I tested the lights. Yahtzee. With all my wiring in place, I flipped it over and attached the copper touch pads with CA glue and just a tiny bit of conductive paint for a stronger electrical connection. Once those were secured in place, it was time to pour epoxy. I don't use a ton of epoxy, so having gotten so far into this project and with all the electronics installed, I was really nervous I was going to screw it up. And by the way, big thanks to Total Boat for supplying the epoxy for this project. I don't use much epoxy because I've never really had much luck with it, but then again, I've never used Total Boat. And this is far and away the best results I've ever gotten using epoxy in a project, so it's good stuff. Anyway, I let the epoxy cure, then brought it back to the CNC to flatten it one final time, removing the raised epoxy. Now it's finally time to plug everything in and sit on my throne as the Prince of Bel Air. It didn't work. Well, it did work, but not exactly the way it was supposed to. Remember how I had that stroke of genius to add the touch capacitive lights to complement the touch capacitive MIDI controller? Yeah, that was never gonna work. And so as to not bore you with mundane details, here's a quick explanation. Because both systems are touch capacitive, they sense small variations in electrical current. When you touch whatever's connected to the Arduino, it grounds the circuit, which triggers a response. The same goes for the light sensors. So they're both producing an electrical current and any interruption of that current is interpreted as interference. So every time the Arduino and the light sensors are plugged in at the same time, their signals are fighting each other. See, I didn't think about this beforehand. I tested both the lights and the Arduino throughout the build, but independently, never together, which brings me back to my earlier point, research. I felt like I'd thought of everything and it turns out I missed something. I had the vision, I had the materials, and my machine was capable, but the one tool I really needed to work fell short, my brain. But I'm still happy. This thing plays music, and even though it didn't turn out exactly the way that I wanted it, I'm still gonna enjoy it, which brings me to my final point, learn to love failure. Heck, I love failure so much, I do it almost exclusively. I know failure can sting, this one stung quite a bit for me just because I'd had this idea in my head for so long and it didn't come out how I had imagined. But the more you fail, the more you learn. So I'm learning constantly, which will only make me better. And here are some of the positives. Now I know what to do and what not to do. I can do it again and I probably will. My machine's just fine, nothing broke and no one got hurt. I had fun making it. And I had fun sharing the process. And it freaking works. I played around with it all weekend and my kids having a blast with it too. I think that's what I want the biggest takeaway to be here. Challenge yourself. Do something with your CNC you're nowhere near qualified to do. What's the worst that could happen? 
I'm sorry, I realize this is more like a pep rally than an instructional video, but sometimes that's better. I appreciate you guys sticking around listening to me ramble on. Go do something wacky. Thanks for watching. That'll be good.